Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies on my lunch hour, as always. And my guest is on his lunch hour too, so his company doesn't try and dock him for pay. And uh, we're gonna be talking transportation today. But before I get into that, I um, have a couple things I wanted to talk about. Number one, um, just give uh, kudos to Blue Planet Foundation for last Sunday's student energy uh, group that they had at the Hawaii Convention Center. Um, it was an outstanding event. Um, Rachel James and I went down and talked hydrogen to about 140 uh, high school seniors that came from across the state. And their project was to simulate that they had the challenge of Apollo 13 and they had to somehow save their, their spacecraft. And we were the ones talking about the hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen for energy storage. It was a great opportunity to talk to the kids. And the, the best takeaway for me was I asked each group what the Hindenburg was, and almost nobody ever heard of the Hindenburg. I was so happy, because usually when I say hydrogen, all the old people go Hindenburg, and it's explosive, and it's gonna kill you and stuff. These kids, clean slate, open mind, and they were great to work with. Um, especially the kids from Lanai. Thanks to the kids from Lanai who really latched onto the hydrogen piece, and they're ready to uh, get their whole island set up on a microgrid that runs off of hydrogen energy storage. So it was a great event. So thanks to Blue Planet for putting that on. Other big news for this week is uh, Surfco Hawaii, our local Oahu Toyota distributors, are finally releasing their Toyota Mirai, their fuel cell vehicle um, for lease. And it's a really, really good deal in terms of, I've looked at the leases in California, um, compared to the ones that, the, the ones that Surfco is doing, and Surfco is doing an, an absolutely great lease on that vehicle. And uh, I hope you're on the list. If you're not on the list, they're, they're going through the uh, original list of people who wanted it. And uh, they've got nine vehicles on island that they're putting out there for lease. And um, they're gonna be bringing more in. So we're, look, we're really excited because these are the first privately owned and operated um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in the state. So it's a real, a real uh, milestone for the state of Hawaii. Um, another thing, we, last week we had a, as a guest uh, Mike Stritsky um, from New Jersey, but he's also doing some projects in California. And just before we went on the air, he told us his house in Malibu that it was, he was converting into a hydrogen house had just burned to the ground. So we we're, we we're looking at and talking about the wildfires a little bit. And since then, um, it's been, there's been several lawsuits filed, at least in the Northern California fires, against the utility because the utility may have actually started um, some of those fires. And of course, they're already double the number of fatalities of the worst fire ever in California, uh, worst wildfire. So um, it's another good reason to look at your utility grids and maybe think of a different way that we could be pushing utility um, electricity instead of through wires across wilderness areas and things like that. Um, we're here to talk about transportation today mostly. So. I've got Ryan Wobbins from uh, Burns and McDonald, my favorite electrical engineer. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about hydrogen uh, in transportation. And to start off, I wanna show a little video on uh, what hydrogen's all about, in case you haven't seen it. I try and show this one once in a while and uh, hope you get something out of it. Hydrogen, the simplest element and also the most abundant. Hydrogen makes up roughly 75% of all mass in the universe. Hydrogen also powers most of the stars in our universe. So it's only fitting that it has come to be recognized as a viable alternative energy source. And we need alternatives because fossil fuels are problematic. They're messy, dirty, expensive to obtain and not secure. And they're limited. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is everywhere. Hydrogen can be produced from a wide variety of sources including water itself, using other renewable energies. That means it's clean, really clean. As a zero emission fuel source, the only byproducts are water, heat, and electricity. Easily transported, hydrogen can be stored and distributed on a large scale as either gas or liquid. As a fuel, hydrogen itself is very light. In fact, hydrogen is 472 times more efficient by weight than lead acid batteries. And it isn't just for transportation. Hydrogen can also effectively produce and store energy for power grids. 
Hydrogen gas is transformed into energy within a fuel cell. As hydrogen passes through a fuel cell, electrons are released and an electrical current is produced and captured for use. Electric vehicle motors powered by hydrogen fuel cells are twice as efficient as gas or diesel engines. They can travel farther distances than lithium batteries, especially in heavy vehicles, and can last for decades. Hydrogen-powered fuel cells are scalable to buses and commercial fleets such as trucks, trains, ships, and aircraft. Fuel cells allow for fast, easy refueling, and hydrogen can be easily adapted to current refueling stations, making it a convenient fuel source for everyone. It is a proven, safe, clean, and efficient energy source currently in use worldwide. Hydrogen is everywhere including our clean energy future. I really like that video and we try and show it often because it really kind of captures the whole essence of hydrogen and what it can do for us in transportation and in a grid. And uh, we'd like to use it as part of our outreach and education. We're gonna focus a little bit though, more on transportation. Um, now, Ryan Wobbins, uh, our guest today, is he works um, the microgrid project for us with the Air Force out at Hickam. It's one of his main projects, but he's got a, a pretty broad um, background in, uh, in energy, electrical energy and transportation. He's done a lot of studying on hydrogen and electric transportation since he's been working with us on our projects. And um, so, Ryan, welcome to the show. Good to have you back. Yeah, on thanks the for third, having me. The third week of every month we have Ryan on to to be the expert and, and poke holes through everybody's stories. But the first thing we do with any project, whether it's a microgrid or transportation, is go for efficiencies. So some of the things that uh, big city planners do with efficiency is they look for putting their, their buildings and their, their entire infrastructure around places that people can walk, ride bikes, ride skateboards, ride scooters, basically use that last mile transportation solution so that we don't have as many cars and focus on getting rid of parking stalls and making a lot more pedestrian ways and things like that. So we always look at those at the big big level because number one, they're not as expensive as trying to do mass transit, but they're, they're a good solution. They're clean, um, everybody takes their own responsibility and that, that responsibility is spread down to the individual level and you just use your own energy to get you where you need to go. That's what we start off with. But the next level up is, is kind of an, an area that a lot of people don't understand, and that's public transportation. And I've pointed out before that in public transportation, the idea isn't to save money, not for the government anyway. Public transportation is actually a money loser just about every place it's at. And, you know, but it's important because if you make that, that great um, community where you can walk and skateboard to where you're going to work, your housing is always kind of expensive in those areas. And so the, a lot of the people have to commute from out farther in the suburbs or the, or the um, out in the, the, the farmlands or whatever in some cases. And that transportation gets expensive. And that's where mass transit comes in, where you can have express buses coming in from remote areas where people can afford to get to work. But the, the burden of the cost is, is provided by the government so that those people can, can actually help commerce keep going. So what are some of the costs, Ryan, with public transportation that most of us don't see? Some of the cost of, the capital cost is a big one, absolutely, right off the bat. If you're gonna start taking hundreds and hundreds of people out of their vehicles and move them into something else, the cost is r relatable between all of those vehicles now just being within the, the actual transportation Pub yeah. device. The public side. So you. You already have to have that capital investment, which is huge. That it's in itself has to have a, its own return on investment as, as what makes the world go around. So um, definitely the, the capital cost and then maintenance just on top, just like we have on our own vehicles, the mm -hmm. maintenance and upkeep. Part of that maintenance and upkeep would be the fuel right. and whatever you're using operating to, to run that. Operating costs for the engineers that maintain things and the operators who run the trains, if it's trains, or drive the buses, if it's buses. Yep. Yeah, you have all those costs as well. So, and, and the transportation costs can be pretty significant. Um, you know, here in Hawaii, we're on Oahu, we're struggling with the rail project, which is, you know, I think everybody's gonna like it when, when it's in, but I've watched the cost estimates go from three billion, which is a lot of money. This morning on the news, it's over nine billion now, and it's not even going the full distance that we wanted to, that we planned for in the initial part. 
So it, it is very expensive, especially that initial investment in infrastructure. So, but it's necessary. We have to take care of people that can't afford to live in the urban core and, and come from the suburbs and, and out in the, in the um, outer reaches of the island to get to work. Yeah, absolutely. The, the nice thing about uh, something like the rail, uh, to, to what you talked about earlier, is it's a, it is a highly efficient use of space. Uh, it's, it's very efficient in its own, um, you could say, fuel transportation, um, that one being electrically driven, right, or right. consuming. So it's very efficient from those standpoints. So in the long term, uh, a system like that is great. While it is expensive to run, um, over time, you do reach those, those really low um, marginal costs to, to, to keep it running. Right. But. So if we had a diesel train compared to an electric train, an electric train would be much more efficient um, in terms of using energy, correct? Is that a correct statement? Yeah, it, it can be, absolutely. Converting electrical power to mechanical power is, is, a, is a pretty efficient use of of energy. Mm -hmm. um, diesel, in that sense, is very volatile, as we can see in, in the global market. So that's price really, wise. Yeah. Price wise. So it, it makes it uh, very tough to prove some of those long term figures without yeah. knowing the long term use of diesel. And, and that's an important point, too. Most of the business folks that I've talked to, including some of the tour bus companies, they would love to have a firm fixed price fuel contract for like 10 years or 15 years. If they could have that, they could predict so much better, they could plan so much better, they could make capital investments so much better if they could predict the stable fuel costs. So, you know, that's one of the things that we talk about hydrogen, if we can get it to scale and get that stable cost down um, and project it out where we can provide contracts for hydrogen for energy for a rail project or buses, that we could actually start to stabilize those costs for private sector and let them capitalize off it, as well as the government sector, where they're running public transportation. Mm -hmm. So we were talking a little bit about batteries and um, versus hydrogen for electric vehicles. And the, the video showed how a hydrogen fuel cell makes electricity. But when it comes to um, cost and stuff, a lot of people don't really think about the full life cycle cost of batteries versus hydrogen. But you've done a lot of homework on that. What's, what are some of the factors that maybe people aren't thinking about? So some of the life cycle costs that you gotta be aware of is that when you're exercising and going through the cycles of a battery, the, the way you are adjusting that, the, the chemical makeup that's within there is in a way deteriorating the performance of that battery. While all equipment is in a way deteriorating, our vehicles start to wear down over, over time anyways, the batteries are something that I would consider in an engineering world, they're, they're a little bit shorter. I mean, we're talking, if, even if we want to say 10, 15, 20 years, uh, there are very few design standards that I design to that are of, of that length. Yeah. The only time I do is for batteries, um, and we're getting ready to switch them out. Um, when you start talking about hydrogen, the material and the makeup that you're dealing with, we can start talking more on the side of 50 plus years. That's, that is a design standard more from a utility scale right. or a, a public service. Um, that's what we're designing to. I mean, the rail is not gonna go away in 10 years. And that, that's designed likely well past the 50 year mark. Um, so the cost of ownership just by the lifetime of what you're getting is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, the constant cost of ownership, if we want to look, just compare the two, uh, there's, a, there's a capital cost that's a little bit harder to speak to, but the energy storage one is really neat. The best battery manufacturer in the United States is really good, and they're trying to get to somewhere around $100 per kilowatt hour. Um, that, from a car standpoint, gets them on the, on the price point of an internal combustion engine performance, which is great for them. When we talk energy storage for things like an electrical grid or for some greater use, and we look at a cost per kilowatt hour of storage for hydrogen, it's somewhere at like $10. Or, and it could be probably even get cut in half when you start scaling that and providing engineering effort on, on that type of technology. Uh, you, you look at a battery that's been, they're really squeezing out what they can by by massive production um, at 100, that's 10 times more than right. that of hydrogen. So you're talking about a 
tenfold increase in, in price to store energy in a battery long term compared to storing it in a hydrogen system. Yeah, absolutely. Ten times. And that's that's just the storage piece. We can't say that hydrogen is ten times cheaper. That, that's right, not what right. I'm trying to say. But but yeah, the, from a storage perspective. What you, how you have to store the energy. How you have to store it, which is why you see something like a bus or a semi leaning more towards hydrogen uh, right. for, for many reasons, but one being the really high energy density, that storage that mm -hmm. you want to have. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and talk to Ryan about that energy storage piece, especially in big vehicles. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man. Uh, again, on my lunch hour here at Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, we got Ryan Wilbins from Burns and McDonald, uh, electrical engineer that's kind of getting into the finer technical points of um, transportation and energy, energy storage in transportation. We finished off the last segment by pointing out that when it comes to just the storage piece, like how you store the energy in a vehicle, that your best, best batteries on the market today, your lithium cobalt batteries that are used in in your best electric cars are 10 times more expensive than similar technology to store the same kind of energy in batteries, I mean in uh, hydrogen. Because hydrogen, when you, when you look at how it's stored, it's stored in cylinders that don't have a whole lot of components in there that degrade. The, the, com the cylinders last, they're designed to last, you know, decades, not just years. Um, and they're fairly reasonably cost, uh, uh, priced out. So you can make hydrogen storage fairly cheaply and it lasts a long time. Whereas if you have to replace batteries, you got a couple problems. Number one is the cost of the batteries, but also at the end of the life of a battery, you've got hazmat issues. You don't want to put them in landfills. You've got all kinds of um, chemicals in there you don't want in landfills. Um, they tell you right when you buy lithium batteries right now for any of your, any of your small devices, don't, just throw, don't throw them in a fire and don't dispose of them in a landfill. But you know that's where a lot of them go. And it's not good. If that stuff leaches into the water system, uh, now you got problems in your water system as well. So, Ryan, what are some of the other things to consider? You know, as we go into the transportation mode, and we just we talked about starting with um, the last mile and doing mode shifting, and we talked about public transportation. Um, let's talk a little bit about moving energy. You know, I mean, one of the things I point out to people that come to our station in Hickam is, it's the size of a regular gas station in a footprint. Mm -hmm. But in that footprint of maybe 10 or 12,000 square feet, it's the same as you're having your oil field, your oil pipeline, your oil tanker, uh, your oil refinery, and then the gas truck that drives the gasoline to your station from the oil refinery, all in a 20-foot container or two behind the wall. In other words, you lose that entire transportation cost of your product. So right now, if you just took a, if you're, if you're a, a Covey person or a, any kind of person that studies business efficiency, they say that transportation is a non-value added aspect of your product. It doesn't make your product better or worse, it just gets it to where the market is, but it adds no value. Well, think of how much money is spent by an oil company to pull the oil out of the ground, push it through a pipeline, put it in a tanker, take the tanker and move it, hopefully you don't spill any along the way, get it to a refinery, use the energy to refine that, that oil into a, a more refined uh, fuel that you can use, and then take that fuel and put it in a truck and take it to your, 
your gas station to put in your car. All those transportation pieces are added to the process. And with hydrogen, you can basically make it right on site. Yeah, comparing the two is, is very interesting. Um, we've spoken earlier, I don't know how many shows ago it was, about the, the return on energy investment you get from going out and grabbing oil. It used to be really easy, you just stick a straw on the ground, and it's just like oil popped up if you're in the right spot. That return was something in the fold, I think it was 100 to 1 or something like that, which was great when it was really easy to get, and we were selling at a, still a relatively high price point for, for oil. Um, that, that, from a financial standpoint, makes a lot of sense. Um, even from an energy standpoint, we're spending less. But over time, it's getting harder to, to go after and find those resources. The time you spend on all the places you miss, you gotta add all that up from, right. from an energy. Right, it something to drill a hole, even if it's dry. Yep, and when you add all of that up, that 100 to one is decreasing over time. That, that's probably not gonna surprise anybody unless we found a big bucket of free oil just sitting somewhere we could tap off of. Hydrogen, when you compare that, we could set up that number today, and now I'm gonna look it up now because I don't know what it is, but to produce hydrogen on site from water, water being a really known source that we can get um, locally, almost anywhere that, that we actually are residing anyways, and the, the return on that energy investment can be for, for what? Just simply from solar to hydrogen. And we can find that number and that's, that's set. That number will actually get better over time as engineering efficiencies come from the, the, the electrolyzers, the fuel cells, the solar, mm -hmm. the electrical components in between. So while the, the return on energy investment for something like hydrogen will go up, the return on energy investment for something like um, oil and diesel will go down. Go down, right. So, a lot of times when I explain to people what a fuel cell does, I tell them it's a self-charging battery. So you put hydrogen and air in, and it creates an electrical current. Rather than having to just store the energy inside the battery, where you have metal plates and, and um, an electrolyte, things like that, you're basically using the fuel cell. Uh, in fact, I I'll tell people there's, there's dry cells, there's wet cells, and there's fuel cells. I mean, it's just another kind of battery. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're taking chemical energy and pushing it into this fuel cell and letting it generate its own electricity on board a vehicle. And that makes it really efficient, especially when you get to big vehicles. So we talked a little bit before we came on the air about Nikola Motors, the folks doing the big trucks. And what impresses you the most about that guy's concept of, of what he's trying to do in that large class eight um, truck line that, that makes sense with hydrogen? Yeah, what's what's interesting about them and what's interesting about the, the car manufacturer, Tesla, I'll, I'll kind of lump them into the same idea, is that they're both, they're producing their own vehicles. They're, they are producing a new vehicle to go after an existing market segment of a combustion-driven engine. So when they produce more, every one of their investment dollars now is, is going towards something that's renewable. If a traditional car manufacturer, um, I think we said today the Volkswagen, right. had decided to invest something like $50 billion in the next five years on electric-driven uh, vehicles, all of those dollars spent are actually eating away on their current revenues that they're getting because right. they're gonna take a, some of their combustion engine and replace those sales with electric. So that is a tough decision for a company like that to make. Um, when a company that large makes it, um, that that means a lot to the renewable energy transportation world. What you can see and the reason those companies are doing is the success that these other car manufacturers are having and the impact they're having on the market. So when I look at the hydrogen-based um, trucking, that is incredible that, that the decision is being made. While they do offer both, they're, they're putting, that I know of, they're putting primary focus on hydrogen. Right. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're doing the calculations. They're the, they have the most invested um, technology. Like from a company standpoint, that's their baby right there. They got to mm -hmm. take care of that. And if they're making this the play on hydrogen, when that scales, uh, look out for the cost of hydrogen just to, to change um, across the world. Because the transportation industry is very heavy on shipping. Mm -hmm. So once the shipping side makes a decision, 
and everybody else is going to, there will be market pressures for everyone else to follow. Mm -hmm. um, there, there will always be competing technologies between batteries and hydrogen because there is a, there is different applications in when one is better than the other. But when one has such a bigger market presence, that, that will have an effect on just the, the renewable transportation energy market as a whole. Yeah, so, so those of you that aren't familiar with uh, Nikola Motors, you should go check them out online. But they basically have a class eight, 18 wheeler tractor trailer with a sleeper cab in. They have one without a sleeper cab, but um, it's a really sharp design vehicle with all the bells and whistles you see on a, a high end car. Lane departure warnings, um, automatic braking, um, regenerative braking like you see on all electric vehicles that helps generate power back into batteries. And, and even hydrogen fuel cell vehicles have batteries in them. But the bottom line is, they can get this vehicle to go over a thousand miles. They're advertising a thousand to twelve hundred miles uh, of range on one fill up of, of uh, hydrogen in their tanks, which they're saying is going to be a hundred kilograms. They're going to carry a hundred kilograms of hydrogen and be able to go virtually halfway across the U.S. So they know they can put a few stations out there or localize some stations, get a market going that transports goods and, and exactly kick off that economic boost that you're talking about. Um, the interesting thing though is the companies that are really leaning forward on this, including Toyota, have started to realize that they have a role to play in the infrastructure side as well because they're bringing the chicken and the egg or at least parts of the egg to go with the chicken because mm -hmm. if they don't, things won't get started. Yep. And so Nikola Motors is doing the same thing. They're bringing stations. But the interesting thing is on the electric transportation, the more electric vehicles you have that are battery reliant, the higher the infrastructure costs go. The more vehicles you have that are hydrogen reliant, the, the smaller your infrastructure costs are because you get economies of scale by producing large volumes of hydrogen in a plant, distributing it via pipelines or things that you don't have to have rolling stock on and get it out there for the vehicles to use or create it right on site with electrolysis. And so you, you can get those economies of scale. Yeah, trans, transporting energy is, is an interesting market because unless it's stored, it has to happen instantly. Transmission lines are, are always, and they are very efficient from, from the extremely high 90s at, at transferring energy, but it has to happen instantly. Right now, yeah. So if you're transporting uh, an amount of energy and it's hydrogen, you're just gonna put it in its tank and you're gonna go move it, just like you do diesel fuel today. Um, if you're gonna go transport batteries, um, you're, you're expending that energy while you're moving it. To move batteries. To move batteries. And so, you, you know, you're gonna get somewhere and it's, it could be de-energized at that time. So that's when you're talking about the infrastructure cost being higher because on, on the other side of the model, you're gonna say, oh, well, let me put the battery in the end location in the transmission line. And now I have a very high efficient use. Um, well, that, that costs a lot of money. Yeah. If, if I could just truck a tank over there, well, that might be a much cheaper, uh, mm -hmm. a much quicker ROI than, than the other one. So yeah, there's, there's an infrastructure difference because all relating back to the cost per kilowatt hour stored. Mm -hmm. And that cost keeps dropping for hydrogen. The, the better technology gets, um, the better the systems get. And, you know, batteries will improve when I think nanotechnology finally gets real. You know, the, 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 the um, scientific sector gets that, but so will fuel cells. Everything that helps a battery is going to help a fuel cell get cheaper and better and more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. So, Very related technologies. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for Stan Energy Man this week. And uh, thanks to Ryan Wilbins again for being out here. Thanks to Susan for coming in the studio to make sure I didn't say anything rude. And uh, to Robert and Cindy here in the studio for making all the magic happen. And hope you join us next week Friday on Stan Energy Man. Aloha.